Mandibular anesthesia, increasing the success of injection techniques with Dr. Gregory G. Winter. He completed his DDS from the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, University of Maryland School of Dentistry. He received an additional training at the University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine and York Hospital, where he did his general practice residency. He received a faculty appointment at the University of Maryland School of Dentistry in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery as a clinical instructor. He maintains a private practice focused on general dentistry in Baltimore, Maryland. Ms. Marion C. Mansky, RDH, MS, is the Associate Professor, Senior Coordinator at the University of Bridgeport, Phone School of Dental Hygiene. She earned her MS degree from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. In addition to her faculty appointment at the University of Bridgeport, she serves as adjunct faculty at the University of Maryland where she conducts the local anesthesia courses for students and licensed dental hygienists. Blockade of the inferior alveolar nerve is the most commonly desired goal of mandibular anesthesia. It is also one of the most difficult blocks to achieve. Mandibular anesthesia depends on successfully blocking branches of the trigeminal nerve, especially the inferior alveolar nerve which supplies mandibular teeth and surrounding soft tissue. The comparatively dense mandibular bone often precludes effective anesthesia from supraperiosteal injections with available agents, except perhaps in the incisor region. However, the inferior alveolar nerve is accessible before it enters the body of the ramus through the mandibular foramen. Deposition of local anesthesia in this area will produce conduction blockade. In this program, we will examine the most commonly used injection techniques for mandibular anesthesia. Our goal in this video is to increase your success in achieving profound anesthesia of the mandible. Local anesthetics are among the most effective drugs available. If deposited near peripheral nerves, they will produce reliable and predictable anesthesia. Mastery of clinical anesthetic technique therefore rests upon a solid understanding of anatomy. Objectives. Locate and identify the anatomic structures used to determine local anesthesia injection sites. Integrate an understanding of the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve and associated tissues into the administration of local anesthesia in clinical dental practice. Identify the pathways of the nerves that innervate the oral cavity. Anatomy is important for successful local anesthesia because it is the true test of proper and successful local anesthesia. Without it, you cannot pinpoint the anatomical landmarks necessary for success. We're specifically dealing with the trigeminal nerve. There are three divisions, the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular divisions. Uh, most importantly, the mandibular carries sensory and motor nerves. In order to get good dental anesthesia for patients, we're dealing with the maxillary and the mandibular divisions. The oral cavity receives innervation from the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal. A smaller part of this nerve is motor, while the larger part is sensory. The sensory portion forms a large half-moon-shaped ganglion called the trigeminal semilunar or Gasserian ganglion which is situated in the trigeminal depression of the middle cranial fossa. Originating from the trigeminal ganglion are three large nerve trunks, the ophthalmic V1, the maxillary V2, and the mandibular V3, the largest and the only one that carries both sensory and motor nerve fibers. The mandibular nerve passes through the foramen ovale down into the infratemporal fossa where it separates into a small anterior and a large posterior root.
The anterior root gives off motor branches that innervate the muscles of mastication. Then, as the buccal nerve, it crosses the coronoid notch of the ramus to innervate the cheek. Small fibers pass through the buccinator muscle to supply the buccal gingiva and the mucosa in the posterior mandible. The posterior root of the mandibular nerve is predominantly sensory, although it does provide motor innervations to the mylohyoid muscle and the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. As it descends, it divides into three branches. The auriculotemporal nerve supplies the skin of the temporal region of the head, the lingual nerve provides general sensation for all of the lingual gingiva and the mucosa of the floor of the mouth and the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. In combination with a branch of the facial nerve, the corda tympani, the lingual nerve also carries parasympathetic innervations to the submaxillary and sublingual glands and taste fibers to the tongue. The third branch of the posterior root of the mandibular nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, passes through the mandibular foramen to enter the mandibular canal. Running forward in the canal, this nerve gives off branches to the teeth of the lower jaw and the surrounding alveolar bone. The mylohyoid nerve branches off just before the inferior alveolar nerve enters the mandible. It provides motor function to the mylohyoid muscle and to the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. Also, it often innervates the skin covering the lower chin and occasionally provides sensation to the mandibular teeth as an accessory nerve. The mental nerve emerges as a lateral branch of the inferior alveolar nerve and passes through the mental foramen to innervate the interior buccal gingiva and the lower lip and chin. After exiting the mental foramen, the inferior alveolar nerve continues anteriorly within the mandibular incisive canal as the incisive nerve, innervating the mandibular first premolar, canine, and incisors and adjacent gingival tissues. The pterygomandibular space as seen in this transverse section across the ramus of the mandible is bounded medially by the medial pterygoid muscle, laterally by the mandibular ramus, posteriorly by the parotid gland, and anteriorly by the oral mucosa, submucosal connective tissue, and the buccinator muscle. Superiorly, it is defined by the lateral pterygoid muscle. Within the pterygomandibular space are the inferior alveolar and lingual nerves, the inferior alveolar artery and vein, and the sphenomandibular ligament. The inferior alveolar and lingual nerves enter the pterygomandibular space by passing between the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. The lingual nerve follows a downward and lateral course through the space until it reaches the most anterior and inferior corner where it exits into the floor of the mouth. The inferior alveolar nerve passes through the pterygomandibular space lateral and downward behind the lingual nerve assuming a slight S-shaped configuration until it reaches the mandibular foramen. Objectives. List three factors that contribute to patient safety and comfort during the administration of local anesthesia. Describe proper care and handling of contaminated needles and cartridges. Discuss the factors to consider when selecting a needle. Understand the advantages of different gauge needles. So there are many advantages for using the aspirating, breech-loading, reusable syringe. Mm -hmm. One, it is long-lasting and sterilizable. Two, when you use the cartridge of anesthesia, you're actually able to see the anesthesia be delivered through the needle. And third, when you aspirate, you're able to visualize whether you have a positive uh, aspiration. Yes, I agree with that. Um, in addition, the syringe sometimes, though, is heavy and it is also large for some operators. Their hands might not be big enough, so that's why that they have the petite syringes to use, which are really great. There are many considerations when selecting a needle. First, it's, it needs to be stainless steel and sterile, and also it has to be disposable. However, these needles do dull quickly, so you can use it about four times before you have to switch to a new needle. 
it's appropriate to use a short needle for infiltrations. That's typically all throughout the maxilla and some areas on the mandible. The long is primarily used for blocks, and right. that's on the maxilla and the mandible. Right. We also have to consider the gauge size. The needle gauge refers to the diameter of the lumen. The larger the gauge, the smaller the diameter of the needle. There are three sizes for the needle gauge. There's the 25, the 27, and the 30 gauge needles. The 25 is the most rigid needle with the least amount of deflection. That's followed by a 27 gauge. Lastly, there's a 30 gauge needle, which is the least rigid and has the most amount of deflection. And you choose a needle size depending on what depth the penetration you're needing to go to. So typically, if you're doing a, a block, you're gonna choose a 25 or a 27. 30s are pretty much for infiltration. Well, it's interesting because patients typically can't tell the difference between a 25, a 27, or a 30 gauge needle. Studies show that if you use a 25 gauge needle, you have a 100% chance of detecting an aspiration. If you use 30 gauge needle, you only have a 2% chance of detecting an aspiration, meaning you could be in the blood vessel and not know it. And typically we use 25s or 27s most of the time, and you need to do uh, aspirations two times. You have to get two negative aspirations to make sure you're not in, in a vessel to truly be successful with local anesthesia. When used correctly, the single dose cartridge, sterile needle, Jenker recapper, and aspirating syringe combine to ensure accurate placement of the local anesthetic solution with minimal risk to the patient. Proper care and handling of contaminated needles and cartridges will reduce the risk of sharp exposure to the patient and clinician. Needles should be immediately covered by a protective shield to prevent accidental needle stick with a contaminated needle. Several devices are available to assist with recapping. Recapping devices come in cardboard, metal, and plastic materials. Approved sharps containers are mandated to dispose of contaminated needles, used cartridges, and other sharps. The containers should be properly disposed of according to federal, state, and local regulations. For mandibular anesthesia involving the inferior alveolar nerve block, the 25 to 27 gauge long needle is generally preferred. Advantages of this needle include ease of aspiration and accuracy of placement as the 25 to 27 gauge needle resists deflection and breakage. Finally, the 25 to 27 gauge needle is no more likely to produce pain than thinner needles when inserted correctly. Objective. Discuss the application of topical anesthesia prior to the administration of local anesthesia. There's many different types of topical anesthetics. There's sprays, gels, liquids, and ointments. For our training purposes, we're going to be using 20% benzocaine. We like to use the benzocaine because it's an overdose problem is very low and it's poorly absorbed systemically, so you don't have any concerns with that particular ester. There are certain topicals and injectables that should be delivered with care. There's a genetic condition called methemoglobinemia, which can cause issues for certain patients. You should consult directions for proper use. To desensitize the mucosa before the needle insertion, a topical anesthetic is applied to the injection site. The mucosa is first dried with gauze and a small amount of topical anesthetic is then placed with a cotton tipped applicator. After the topical anesthetic agent has had time to take effect, approximately one minute for mucosal tissue, two minutes for palatal, it will result in mucosal anesthesia to a depth of approximately two to three millimeters. Residual topical anesthetic and surface debris are removed with gauze immediately before the injection. Objectives. Identify the proper positioning of the clinician and patient during administration of local anesthesia. Discuss clock positioning in relation to injection techniques. Proper patient positioning is very important for visualization and ergonomics. You want the patient to be laying in a supine position so that you can visualize the injection site while not putting your body in a compromising position. Also, you want the patient supine just in case there's an emergency situation happening. The proper position for the clinician and patient during the administration of mandibular anesthesia is similar for all of the injection techniques reviewed in this program. 
The patient should be placed in the supine position with the legs slightly elevated. This position will avoid many of the psychogenic reactions encountered during the administration of mandibular anesthesia. For the operator performing a nerve block of the right mandible, the clinician may sit in front of the patient to permit visualization of the oral cavity. For the left-handed operator that's performing a nerve block of the left mandible, the clinician may sit behind the patient in the one o'clock position. The thumb or a dental mirror is then used to expose the site of injection. Retraction of the tissue to make it taut is critical for visualization and access. Should placing the thumb in this manner prove awkward, the index finger may be used instead. Objectives. Describe and discuss the indications, relevant anatomy, and technique features of mandibular injections. Describe the basic technique steps for safe and effective anesthesia for the inferior alveolar nerve block and the lingual nerve block. The inferior alveolar nerve block or the mandibular block is the most commonly used block in dentistry. It gets everything. Everything, hard tissue, soft tissue, floor of the mouth, and the tongue. Except for the tissue right next to the molars. Right, and it's really great for dental hygienists because it gets the entire quadrant and it's great for non-surgical periodontal therapy. The height of the injection is established by the greatest depression of the ascending ramus, the coronoid notch, a concavity on the anterior lateral border of the ramus. This is also the deepest part of the mandibular raffe. This will be a horizontal line from the anterior moving posteriorly. The vertical intersection will be three-fourths from the notch or one-fourth from the raffe. This intersection is the injection site. It is usually six to 10 millimeters above the occlusal plane. The barrel will be contralateral starting at the second premolar area. With the syringe held parallel to the mandibular occlusal plane and at the level of the coronoid notch, the needle will be in a plane that intersects the mandibular sulcus unimpeded. Because of the lateral flare of the ramus, the syringe must be advanced from the contralateral premolar region for the needle to enter the sulcus. Clinically, the coronoid notch is determined by palpating the most lateral aspect of the anterior ramus. Here, the thumb, kept parallel to the mandibular occlusal plane, is moved into position within the coronoid notch. A line bisecting the thumbnail establishes the height of injection. The insertion point itself is on this line just lateral to the pterygomandibular raffe, the soft tissue roll that denotes the junction between the buccinator and superior constrictor muscles and marks the medial border of the pterygomandibular space. The lateral border of the space can be determined by palpating the deep tendon of the temporalis muscle on the temporal crest of the ramus. The insertion must be made medial to this landmark. With the patient's mouth wide open, the thumb is placed over the anterior border of the ramus and pulled laterally, retracting the cheek and the buccal pad until it rests within the greatest depression of the coronoid notch and is made parallel to the mandibular occlusal plane. With the syringe oriented over the opposite premolars, the needle is advanced to the insertion point lateral to the pterygomandibular raffe and at the height of an imaginary line bisecting the thumbnail. The needle is then inserted slowly through the mucosa and buccinator muscle into the pterygomandibular space. A few drops of anesthetic solution delivered as the needle is advanced may help reduce the discomfort of needle insertion. Once bone is contacted after an insertion of 20 to 25 millimeters, the needle is withdrawn slightly and an aspiration test is performed. After a negative aspiration, approximately two-thirds of the cartridge is injected at a rate not to exceed one cartridge per minute. If lingual nerve anesthesia is desired, it can be easily achieved by withdrawing the needle halfway and depositing the remaining third of the cartridge after a second negative aspiration test. The needle is then removed and recapped and the patient is allowed to rest for the three to five minutes it normally takes for anesthesia to develop. Objective. Describe the basic technique steps for safe and effective anesthesia for the long buccal nerve block.
The long buccal nerve block is necessary when you need to anesthetize the tissues next to the mandibular molars. The inferior alveolar nerve block does not anesthetize that tissue. So if you're doing any periodontal therapy or other dental procedures in that area, you need to anesthetize the tissue separately. And it's a pretty simple injection. And after you've done the IA, it's great that this is a very easy one to do. The long buccal nerve crosses the external oblique ridge in the retromolar area and provides sensory innervation to the mucosa of the cheek and the buccal mucosa and the mucoperiosteum of the molar region. It often supplies accessory innervation to the molar teeth. For this reason, the long buccal nerve block is routinely performed in conjunction with the standard inferior alveolar and lingual nerve blocks. With the palpating thumb on the external oblique ridge, the needle is inserted 2 mm until bone is contacted. One fourth of the dental cartridge is then injected. Objective. Describe the basic technique steps for safe and effective anesthesia for the mental nerve block. The mental nerve block is great for partially edentulous patients. You can use a short needle for this and you can use articane. And if you use articane, you're going to get the buccal and lingual anesthetized. And it's a very high success rate. It's a great injection to give. It anesthetizes both the buccal and lingual, but it also does a two-in-one injection, meaning it does the mental nerve and the incisive nerve. So you're going to get hard and soft tissue anesthesia with just one injection. To be successful, it is critical to locate the mental foramen on your patient. You need to deposit that anesthesia anteriorly to the foramen in order to have success. The mental or incisive nerve may be anesthetized for procedures involving the chin and lower lip, the buccal mucosa and mucoperiosteum from the premolars to the midline, or to supplement an incomplete inferior alveolar nerve block. The target for the injection is anterior to the mental foramen, situated just below the apex of the mandibular second premolar. Its location can be determined with the aid of radiographs and by gentle palpation in the buccal vestibule. For a successful mental nerve block, there is no need to penetrate the mental foramen with the needle. This injection is best accomplished with the clinician positioned behind the patient. The lip is retracted between the thumb and forefinger and the foramen is located. With the tissue pulled taut, penetrate the mucobuccal fold adjacent to the second premolar, advance the needle five to six millimeters, aspirate and slowly deposit about one third of the dental cartridge. Objective, identify the common errors that cause inadequate anesthesia. Failures occur because there is a wide variety of anatomical differences in patients. It's very important that clinicians use the anatomical landmarks in order to achieve successful anesthesia. Occasionally, modifications of the standard technique have to be made to achieve a successful injection. For example, during insertion, the needle may prematurely contact bone. This may occur when the patient has a narrow face, when the insertion point is more lateral than ideal, or when the barrel of the syringe is positioned too posteriorly over the contralateral teeth. Regardless of cause, the needle tip strikes bone too anteriorly and the ramus must be repositioned. The needle is partially withdrawn, the barrel is brought medially, and the needle is reinserted along the new path. Once past the obstruction, the syringe can be repositioned to its original orientation. In the patient where no bone is originally contacted after insertion of 20 to 25 millimeters, there is the possibility that the needle tip is medial to the mandibular sulcus. Deeper insertion is not advised because of the potential for penetrating the parotid capsule and anesthetizing the facial nerve. Depositing the anesthetic at this point will still produce mandibular anesthesia. In the few instances when anesthesia is not obtained, perhaps because the sphenomandibular ligament and a tendon fascia prevent lateral spread of the local anesthetic, reinjection will be necessary. To ensure that bone is contacted during the second injection,
the insertion point can be moved slightly more lateral to the pterygomandibular raphe as the syringe is oriented over the contralateral mandibular first molar region. Then, when bone is contacted, gentle repositioning of the syringe and probing with the needle until it is felt to drop into the mandibular sulcus can be performed. Perhaps the most common cause for failure of the standard inferior alveolar nerve block is positioning the needle tip too far inferiorly. This can happen if the coronoid notch is not palpated correctly. For instance, if the thumb is too medial and palpates the temporal crest. Even if the notch is correctly identified, bisecting the thumbnail will misidentify the insertion point if the thumb is not parallel to the mandibular occlusal plane. These errors are more likely to occur in the patient who is missing posterior teeth. The prognathic mandible represents a special challenge because in this case, the greatest concavity of the coronoid notch is not predictive of the mandibular sulcus which lies some distance superiorly. Therefore, in patients with class three malocclusion, the insertion point should be made 10 millimeters above the line bisecting the thumbnail. Objective. Describe the basic technique steps for safe and effective anesthesia for the Gal Gates nerve block. Mandibular anesthesia is notoriously difficult to achieve. Over the years, we've developed new techniques in order to help increase the rate of success. We have the Gal Gates block and the Akinosi block to help. Right. A lot of times patients can't open wide enough either, and that causes a problem with the inferior alveolar nerve block. So having a Gal Gates and an Akinosi is really helpful for those types of patients. The Gal Gates is considered a true mandibular block. It distributes anesthesia along the entire division of the mandibular nerve. It's a great injection to give for patients that need multiple teeth done in a quadrant. And when you just can't achieve anesthesia with that inferior alveolar traditional nerve block, the Galgates injection is the closest intraoral technique to a true mandibular block. In addition to the inferior alveolar and lingual nerves, the buccal and auricular temporal nerves are often blocked, the buccal nerve approximately 70% of the time. The position of the operator and patient for performing a Galgates block of the mandible is similar to that used for the standard inferior alveolar nerve block, except that the clinician must be able to view the patient's face in addition to the oral cavity. The Gal Gates technique relies on extraoral landmarks to establish the plane of insertion. With the mouth wide open, the angles of the mouth, the lower border of the tragus, and the neck of the condyle lie in the same plane. The needle is advanced in this plane just medial to the deep tendon of the temporalis muscle and through loose fatty connective tissue until it strikes the lateral neck of the condyle. Perhaps the most challenging aspect of this injection is determining the proper angulation of the syringe within the plane of insertion. According to Gal Gates, the lateral flare of the tragus parallels the proper orientation of the syringe. Normally, the barrel of the syringe is placed over the contralateral canine. For a tragus that lies flat against the face, the syringe will be located anterior to the canine. With a divergent tragus, it will be posterior to the canine. The patient is requested to open maximally for this injection. External landmarks, the angles of the mouth, and the inferior border of the tragus are visualized and the plane of insertion identified. The flare of the tragus is also evaluated to determine the angulation of the syringe within the insertion plane. The cheek is then retracted with the non-dominant hand. For convenience, the thumb may be placed on the anterior border of the ramus. The index finger may then be inserted in the intertragic notch and thus behind and lateral to the condylar neck to provide a tactile target for the needle. With a syringe barrel, over the contralateral canine and adjusted mesially or distally, according to the flare of the tragus, the needle is advanced through the mucosa just medial to the previously palpated deep tendon of the temporalis muscle. Normally, the insertion point is slightly distal to the maxillary second molar and at the height of its mesial lingual cusp. A few drops of anesthetic can be injected as the needle is advanced to 25 millimeters until bone is contacted. When the needle impinges on the condylar neck, it is felt as a solid stop in contrast to a glancing contact. Once the target is reached, the needle is backed off the condylar neck 
one or two millimeters, aspiration is performed and the entire content of the cartridge is injected over a one minute period. The patient is then cautioned to keep the mouth open for 30 seconds after the needle is withdrawn. This maneuver is thought to help spread the anesthetic solution and minimize the distance from the injection site to the nerves of interest. Typically, anesthesia occurs within five minutes after injection. When properly performed, the Galgate's block offers some advantages over the standard inferior alveolar nerve block. Because the anesthetic is deposited high up within the pterygomandibular space, it is less likely that various branches of the mandibular nerve, which may provide anomalous innervations of the mandibular teeth, will escape being bathed in anesthetic solution. Also, facial barriers to the anesthetic distribution may be less problematic than with the standard injection. In contrast to the inferior alveolar nerve block, however, anesthesia is unlikely to be achieved with the Galgase injection unless bone is solidly contacted at 25 millimeters, plus or minus two millimeters. Objective, identify the common failures of the Galgates nerve block. The failure rate for the Galgates is quite low. However, if the operator does not have experience providing this injection, the failure rate will actually be increased generally higher than what the traditional inferior alveolar nerve block produces. There are three reasons you would run into failures with a Galgates block. First one is anatomic difficulties. Second one is not dispensing enough anesthesia. And the third is not allowing enough time of onset of the anesthesia. And once the operator overcomes the learning curve, there's like a 95% success rate with this injection. Two reasons commonly account for the failure to encounter bone at the proper insertion depth. First, the clinician may have positioned the syringe improperly within the plane of insertion. If the angle is too great or the insertion point too lateral, bone will be hit prematurely. It is also possible, though unlikely, that the needle will pass through the sigmoid notch of the ramus without striking any bone at all. Bone will not be contacted either if the angle is insufficient or the insertion point too medial. Correction involves ensuring that the point of insertion is just medial to the deep tendon of the temporalis muscle and appropriately reorienting the barrel of the syringe. For instance, if the insertion point is correct but bone is contacted prematurely, then the needle should be partially withdrawn and the barrel of the syringe move mesially along the contralateral quadrant before reinserting the needle to the final depth. A second explanation for failure to contact bone is that the patient's mouth is not open sufficiently for the neck of the condyle to rotate downward and translate forward into the plane of insertion. If the patient cannot perform this task because of trismus, then the Galgates block should not be attempted Instead, the closed mouth technique, akinosi, may be considered. Objective. Describe the basic technique steps for safe and effective anesthesia for the Vazirani akinosi nerve block. The akinosi nerve block is a closed mouth mandibular nerve block. It really helps the clinician in challenging patients. There are three challenging situations where the akinosi block will be effective. The first one is limited opening, the second severe trismus, and third trauma. In the cases where you have severe trismus, there's about an 80% success rate with the akinosi block. The closed mouth approach to mandibular anesthesia or akinosi technique uses the cleft between the ramus and the maxilla in order to access the pterygomandibular space. Although the target for injection is not well identified, being there is no bony contact to indicate proper insertion depth. The needle ends up in the pterygomandibular space somewhat superior and medial to the standard inferior alveolar nerve block. The intent of intraoral anesthesia is similar to that of the Galgates block. With the patient's head adjusted to facilitate visualization of the retromolar region, the cheek is retracted to expose the insertion point midway between the ramus and the maxilla at the height of the mucogingival junction of the maxillary molars. With the syringe parallel to the occlusal plane, the needle is inserted posteriorly through the mucosa and buccinator muscle to enter the pterygomandibular space.
As the needle is slowly advanced to its ultimate depth of 25 millimeters, a few drops of anesthetic can be administered to reduce discomfort during insertion. After a negative aspiration is obtained, the entire cartridge is slowly injected. Although the closed mouth technique is essentially a blind injection, it is technically easy to learn and of great advantage in the patient with limited jaw opening. It is also perceived by some patients as less stressful as the standard inferior alveolar nerve block, yet comparable in onset time and anesthetic efficacy. When failure does occur, it is usually caused by the needle being angled too medially. The maxillary mucosa is sensitive to abrasion by the syringe as it is advanced posteriorly. In response, the patient may move to avoid the stimulation or the clinician may adjust the syringe to improve patient comfort. In closing, we'd like to reinforce the topics discussed in this local anesthesia video. It's important to select the most appropriate technique for the safety of your patient. Successful and safe local anesthesia is the foundation for clinical dentistry. Only with a thorough understanding of local anesthetic techniques and their anatomical basis can we accomplish our goal of providing high quality dentistry in a pain-free environment. Before using any of the drugs or devices discussed or pictured in this program, clinicians should consult the full prescribing information.